Hello everyone, my name is Stephen Coleman Roush, author name S.C. Coleman, or writer. And today I'm going to be talking about a rather complicated subject and this video will be broken down into two parts. The one part being my personal experience with the so-called Customs and Border Protection down at Eagle Pass, Texas. Now across the border is the town of Piedras Negras, which is the Mexican side. And I had encounters with the individuals that are calling themselves Customs and Border Protection, but are nothing short of lawless thugs, specifically carrying out their own personal uh, law, their own concept of uh, jurisdiction over their own, basically, their own domain, right? They appear to answer only to themselves. And they do this under the guise or the color of law. However, they are carrying out essentially the idea behind the United Nations. So, in going into this subject, I will first talk about this border situation. And from my own personal perspective, I did not go to any other border cross. It's only the one at Eagle Pass. But I suspect all of them are the same. And then I'll move on to what that means throughout the United States, specifically using the lens of looking through uh, business dealings in Ohio and the direct correlation to direct governmental control in commerce or alleged governmental control. It's not really government. It's under the color of law. But either way, the whole system is connected and the whole system is built against the interests of all of us that live here, that call ourselves a nation. Um, Whatever label you apply to yourself, you are probably not going to be involved in their scheme. Their scheme is only built to benefit them and no one else. And obviously most of the people that do carry out these conspiracies, they're not, essentially speaking, the head honcho. They're not um, nothing more than, than puppets basically. They fill a position, and anybody can fill that position. That is the way the system is designed. So, uh, first, I walked across the border, which shocked a lot of people for some reason. And that was at Bridge One. There are two bridges at Eagle Pass. We first went through Bridge One. Now, I have done previous videos talking about my experiences of waiting for a visa and that fraudulent system, and also my experiences with uh, other elements of the so-called immigration process. So now I'm going to talk about this particular aspect, which is very troubling for many reasons. First of all, as soon as we walked into the office, and I told him that we did not have a visa. I'm a US citizen and my daughter is as well. We were met with hostility and aggression. Those are primary signs of, first of all, lack of professionalism, and second, thuggery. And that is usually required when somebody is not on stable ground. People who are overly aggressive and hostile or belligerent using the term uh, belligerent, which refers to somebody who is attempting to cause a situation of conflict. That's what these people are doing. And that is very important for the definition of treason in the U.S. Constitution. So they are very belligerent, they are very hostile, and they're very aggressive. The first person I talked to, he, he got angry 
and uh, told me that, oh, what, did I just think that I could cross the border without a visa? And then, just like the immigration in Mexico, these so-called Custom and Border Protection agents, they didn't accept any of my records. I had a consular report of birth abroad. I had two U.S. passports, one for myself, one for my child. I had um, a whole slew of documents, including evidence that I had, in fact, applied for a visa and had been waiting a very long time. I had told them two years as a general uh, rounding up. You know, some people do that. They'll just say the, the, the even number, right? So two years. That's important because of something that one of the uh, uh, so-called supervisors said. So, uh, we, they brought us into a holding room, right? As though we were criminals being uh, put for processing. That's the word they use, processing, right? Like you're going to a jail and you need to be processed. And they separated us treated us like criminals, completely without evidence. In fact, I had all the evidence to the contrary, that, in fact, the evidence I had showed that they were the criminal, and still does. Anyway, they said that pretty much all my papers were fake, fraudulent, I'd made them up. They had no evidence for it, they just claimed it. And then, I heard them... Uh, I, first of all, I notified them multiple times that I, that I was a U.S. citizen, but I was also a veteran. And that definitely put an impact on it. They did not like me. As soon as I said I was a veteran, stuff got a little bit uh, worse, shall we say. Which is interesting, right? These people allegedly are there to serve the interests of U.S. citizens, right? The U.S. citizen nation. Anyway. Uh, there were apparently few U.S. citizens, if any, that were working there. They all had accents. They all spoke as though they could be foreign nationals. Either way, there was not an overall U.S. citizen presence there. Presence. These, this was just like the consulates and embassies that I went to that were allegedly U.S. consulates and embassies where there were no Marines, there were no U.S. citizens running it, they were all foreigners. That's the same with the Customs and Border Protection posts. According to my personal experience, I talked to them. I saw a lot of different workers and there were no U.S. citizens as far as speech pattern and conduct go. They could all have been foreign operatives. And not to mention, they, they're in their hostility, you couldn't ask for names or badge numbers or anything, they were not forthcoming with anything. They just treated you like a criminal for simply being in their presence. Extremely awful individuals that work there. So the lawlessness is not the people, as they always report, crossing the border. The lawlessness is directly with the agents that are operating there. They are, in fact, damaging domestic tranquility. And they're also, they're also linked to the commerce scheme. Anyway, they accused me of providing fraudulent evidence with, uh, fraudulent uh, documents without evidence. And they treated us like criminals. And then they decided that, um, that my fiance needed to be separated from me. Uh, and she was going to be taken to Bridge 2. Now, they, I did overhear them saying that they were short-staffed and they needed more people to process her. I don't believe any of that, of course. And then the one guy said that he wanted the baby to go with the mother, which, first of all, not his decision to make. But I still, I sort of agreed with it, because it's an infant and is still nursing. So <clears throat> that takes us to Bridge 2. Now, Bridge 2 is also called, uh, referred to in Google, as the Camino Real Pass. And when I went there orig uh, originally, they were, it was very hard to find. There were no signs or anything to help you. And it appeared like you could just accidentally cross the border there. 
and you wouldn't have a turnaround. And considering the hostile nature that these people treat anyone, they would not be forthcoming or helpful to U.S. citizens that get lost and end up crossing the border. In fact, they would treat you exactly as you would expect. And don't forget your documents, because they'll accuse you of having fraudulent documents, but just imagine how they would treat somebody who forgot their documents at home. Very spectacular level of lawlessness with the border agents, mind you. So finally, after they told us we had to park very far away, and I had to walk, and I wasn't allowed to wait, I asked them where my family was, and everyone pretended like they didn't know what I was talking about. So finally, when I started telling them that what they were doing was criminal activity, and that you, you're not allowed to separate families, you're not allowed to separate a father from his daughter, you're not allowed to do any of this stuff. They're not, everything they're doing is unlawful and they have no authority to do it. They're operating in the color of law and they're using the threat of force and thuggery to get it done. Well, that's when they suddenly knew what I was talking about. As soon as I started telling them that what they were doing was a crime, so they thought that the best way to deal with this was to have a supervisor named Tapia talk to me. This lady was a, a pressure cooker, right? She, she was set to blow. She was a very volatile individual, extremely hostile, unprofessional, and belligerent attempting to cause a circumstance and instigate a situation in which I would react and then that would give them pretext to do something nasty. Take it out what you will. Of course, it didn't give them that pretext. I'm not an idiot. I recognize the superior force. Now, what should be done, obviously, with these people, and what I'll continue into context is that it is likely there will be a requirement for superior force to be brought against them because I don't imagine these individuals would simply and peaceably uh, lay down arms or stop doing what they're doing, right? That, that would be a pipe dream to think that. But either way, first I had to talk to a supervisor named Rodriguez and that was after I had to go back back and forth because they wouldn't allow me to wait. So I had to walk about uh, 15 minutes to where my mother, mother had parked and was waiting for me. And then I'd walk 15 minutes back and so on and so forth. And because they wouldn't allow me to wait, I did uh, every half hour rounds. I'd always come up with some excuse so I could return, right? I lost my phone, whatever. Anyway, I talked to this young man named Novak who seemed to have an American accent. He's one of the few that did. And um, we had a rather polite conversation about nothing. And, but he, he, was, he wasn't anything important, just a watchman. Mm -hmm. And then I spoke to this supervisor, Rodriguez, who had gold oak leaves on his shoulder, like he's some sort of colonel or whatever. Thinks himself uh, equivalent to uh, you know, a colonel in the Marine Corps. Uh, uh, Colonel's a, a bird, actually, so it'd be a, a major, right? Major in the Marine Corps. Certainly not. But this supervisor, Rodriguez, who thinks he's a major, took me into this holding cell area where they hold people in their custody, right? Like they're, they're, like they're arresting murderers or something. And, which they're not, obviously. They, they act like they are because they want to treat everyone any way they want. And they want to kill people. And they despise U.S. citizens and especially veterans. That's very obvious in their conduct. And when somebody repeats their veteran and all this other stuff, instead of, you know, ascertaining this, they knew I was. They simply wanted a pretext to abuse me. And uh, I, I wasn't going to give them that because I'm not the criminal. They are. 
anyway, so this Tapia, first of all, I had for, informed them on multiple occasions what they're doing is criminal activity, and she saw fit to tell me I was not allowed to speak. Another crime. She also told me that she did not care what happened to us. Talking about two U.S. citizens here, an infant child, myself, and I'm a veteran. She doesn't care what happens to us. Is that the kind of person that you want working at the U.S. border? It is no surprise that we have the issues that we have today because individuals like that are being allowed to supervise the posts at the border. Clearly, UN thugs. So, she also said that I was there at her privilege, right? That she, it was her domain, basically, and that she could tell me everything that, that she wanted, right? I, I was there entirely at her privilege. She was the lord of this post, or lady. Well, clearly, that's what she thought. But either way, I understand the position and circumstance, and so I didn't say anything. I allowed them to commit their crimes simply for the fact that they have superior force in numbers and that they had a hostage, my fiance. They would certainly use her in a way to abuse me, and they did, and this Supervisor Tapia told me that she would be the last to be processed because I had deigned to tell them that what they're doing is criminal activity. Now, here's the reason why you have to tell somebody that what they're doing is criminal. Mens rea is state of mind. It means that someone cannot commit a crime unless they know what they're doing is a crime. Now, if you inform them what they're doing is a crime and they don't want you to speak, it shows a state of mind. They know what they're doing and it is willful. So she said that, that my fiance was going to be the last to be processed, but they did provide my daughter to me. Obviously, they are afraid of the child trafficking implications. But it appears not, they're, they're not very afraid of the kidnapping and hostage holding implications. Anyway, they, they are very coercive, and they also attempted to coerce my fiancé into taking the COVID vaccine, which could constitute an attempt to kill. In addition, they coerce other people that come across the border into getting vaccinations, including children. They attempted to coerce my fiance into giving a vaccine to my infant daughter without consulting me. That's attempt to kill of an infant. Keep that in, in your mind. Also, when I asked the supervisor Rodriguez what I was supposed to do with my daughter considering she was still nursing, he said he didn't care and that I can give her formula. It's twice we have border agents telling me they don't care. Now, when it comes to that thing that I mentioned about applying for a visa, I had said that I had filed two years ago. Now, the agent, this agent, the supervisor, Tapia, told me that it hadn't been two years ago. And I said, well, okay, then how long has it been? She did not respond to me. She gave, brought this very hostile, hostile attitude. And technically speaking, it had been two years, but that's a rounding up. It had gone into the vicinity of two years, being past a year and something else. And that's still a very long time and excessive. It is excessive. So, for nine hours, my fiancé was held, and every half hour I returned, as I said before, making up different excuses like I forgot my phone, other things like that. Now, the only thing that they allowed me to provide my fiancé was a paper with phone numbers, that of myself and my mother.
And they, as I said, they wouldn't allow, allow us to wait there, so I had to walk like 15 minutes distance from the nearby ballpark. That's the only place they said I could park, which I know is a lie, but I did see other people waiting. They didn't uh, give them as much of a problem, and it likely has to do with the fact that I'm a veteran. But they also got very snippy about me talking around and asking around because they knew that I'm a veteran, I've experienced, and I know how to snoop around a situation, right? I know how to um, notice patterns, look for terrain, activity, all that stuff. That's probably why they didn't want me snooping around. But they were clearly afraid, but also they despised me. So, the supervisor Rodriguez, I, I asked him about the process, and I asked them if, if they were fed, the people in this facility. And he told me that of course they were. And that what, did I think that they just took somebody into their custody and then just let him sit there for hours? I said, yeah, basically. Well, what I said is that you would be surprised about the things that have been happened to people. So it is a kind of an evasive response. Anyway, I was informed later by my fiance that they had indeed been fed like three of those frozen chicken nuggets that are cold with two drops of sauce. Now I suspect that that was because I had said something that then they and they did indeed not feed the people that they held in their custody for so long. And this of course was after repeated appeals, mind you. So imagine how they would treat US citizens without documents. And it will be worse if it's a veteran. You can guarantee that. If imagine that you work in the military and for some reason you're in Mexico and you get all your documents taken say by the immigration system down there and then you cross the border ho 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 it for a treat that person will never forget going through those border posts because the agents that run them are in completely lawless and criminal anyway uh i was informed also later that the rooms were kept extremely cold and that Gardenia was not, or my fiance, Gardenia, was not allowed the provision of insulating clothing. They also locked her in a room alone for an hour. I guess what is their version of solitary confinement. And it brings to mind the episode in Avatar The Last Airbender, that TV show, <laughs> in which they went to this prison called The Boiling Rock and the uh, inmates were kept in this freezing refrigerator type room, which is basically solitary confinement. And this, it was all specifically using my fiance as a means to deprive myself and my daughter of not only our rights, but also to abuse us in any way they could. That is willful contempt for U.S. citizens and the armed forces. These people at the border do not respect the force of the U.S. military. That's pretty, that's pretty problematic. Anyway, it come, when it comes to the geography of the area, it's very clear that these posts are not set up with a tactical mindset. They're built specifically for harassing and, be, and to be difficult to navigate. But if you know where they are, they are not tactically built. This border post on, on Bridge 2, it sits in essentially a valley area and you have multiple angles that look down on it. That's not a good positioning if you're thinking tactically. There's also a hill just below the multi-purpose center or ball field, which has a direct line of sight 
to all of the entrances basically within that post. This is very important for the advantage of a shooter or somebody who is attempting to watch the area from a distance. They would get a very good line of sight from that hill that's just below the ballpark. So whoever built these posts was not a tactically minded individual. It's very clear that these posts are designed to hide activity from U.S. citizens. Again, the lack of signage and all that stuff. But as well, the reason why it would be put in that valley is so that U.S. citizens pass by it and none the wiser. Don't, if they even drive in that area, most people avoid the border posts because the area is depressed. And it's done that way because they want to get away with this UN operation without people going through and seeing it. And I would guarantee I'm one of the few, if the only, U.S. citizen that has actually crossed the border in that manner. But it was out of necessity, which I told them multiple times, and they didn't care. Like they said, three times. Or, well, it's more like twice, but yeah, like two people said at least, they didn't care. So, so let's get into what the violations of these are, of this activity. In 18 USC, that's the United States Code. Now these codes are in many respects fraudulent, but they do provide a precedent in the fact that these are the codes that they're supposed to be, that they're using as the basis for their operations. So this is Title 18 Crimes and Criminal Procedure, Part 1 Crimes, Chapter 13, Civil Rights, Section 242, Deprivation of Rights Under Color of Law. Whoever under color of any law, statute, ordinance, regulation, or custom, willfully subjects any person in any state, territory, commonwealth, possession, or district to the deprivation of any rights, privileges, or immunities secured or protected by the Constitution or laws of the United States by reason of his color or race, or to different punishments, pains, or penalties on account of such person being an alien or by reason of his color or race, that are prescribed for the punishment of citizens shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than one year or both and if bodily injury results from the acts of a committed in violation of this section or if such acts include the use, attempted use, threatened use of a dangerous weapon, i.e. a gun, explosives or fire shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than 10 years or both and if death results from the act committed in violation of the section, or if such acts include kidnapping, or an attempt to kidnap, aggravated sexual abuse, or an attempt to commit aggravated sexual abuse, or an attempt to kill. That's very important, especially for the vaccine, coercing the vaccine to an infant. Shall be fined under this title or imprisoned for any term of years of life or both, or may be sentenced to death. Now, the code on the conspiracy is very similar, and both apply because in this context, every single person that was on that shift that was acting to the deprivation of rights of myself, my daughter, and also my fiance, well, they were involved in a conspiracy that involved kidnapping and an attempt to kill. That warrants the death penalty for every person that was on that shift. Anyway, let's get into the specific constitutional violations. Uh, with the U.S. codes, of course, those two U.S. codes, although they would have violated other U.S. codes. But first we should state that in article 4 of the u.s constitution it states that this constitution and laws of the united states shall be made in pursuance thereof and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the united states shall be the supreme law of the land and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby anything in the constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding notwithstanding means that it has no standing and it doesn't mean anything notwithstanding is 
does not mean the way that they often use it. It has to do with something that has standing, something that can stand. Something to the contrary cannot stand, essentially. So in Article 4 we get this idea of the supreme law of the land. Now the one section that they use, and this is where it gets into operating at the color of law, is that in Section 8 it states to establish a rule, rule, a uniform rule of naturalization and uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies throughout the United States. Now that's a charge to the Congress and they liberally use that to deprive people of other rights willfully such as the deprivation of the liberty of speech that this supervisor lady did involving kidnapping including kidnapping of my child and my fiance. And this gets into the Fifth Amendment in which it states that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. The U.S. Constitution stipulates the due process of law and it does not involve the privilege and whims of a supervisor Tapia who thinks that she is not going to be held accountable for her crimes. And neither will any of those people that did egregious acts of treason under the color of law. Now, it states that in the Sixth Amendment, all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial. They accused us of crimes, and we had no trial. They simply accused us, and therefore it was so, because they are UN thugs operating under the color of law. And they are certainly warranting the death penalty, because you can only imagine what they would do if they thought they could get away with it. If they didn't have myself and others snooping in on them, basically. And also, no excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. That is the Eighth Amendment. That's the only stipulation in the Constitution, mind you. The punishment cannot be cruel or unusual. In the past, kidnapping would have been referred to as man-stealing, and the majority of people that stole a man, man-stealing, would be hanged. So it's not unusual. And I would, I would argue that it's not cruel. Ne neither is it cruel, because these people don't care about the U.S. citizens, they would, without a second thought, murder any number of us. So it's perfectly warranting to remove somebody who is in open treason and has no respect and despises anybody who served in the armed forces of the United States. Also, in the Ninth Amendment, it states that the enumeration of the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. So, regardless of whatever nonsense about their jurisdiction over immigration or whatnot, no matter how much they hide under that, that is a direct violation of the Ninth Amendment, as well as all the others, of course. Also, the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people, not to Supervisor Tapia nor Supervisor Rodriguez who thinks he's the equivalent of major. And the judicial power of the United States shall not be construed to extend, uh, well, that's not really important. So there we go. Now, they also provided this paper which is a charge sheet. So after they did all of these things, they saw fit to charge a crime. That's uh, very fitting. They, they're, of course, um, immune to criminal activity. They can't 
be involved in crime, apparently. Um, also, I, I did forget to include here the definition of treason, but I'll go ahead and put it up on the screen so that you can see exactly what the wording for treason in the Constitution is, and that everything that these people at the border do is exactly what the definition of treason is. They are involved in treason, but they are invo also involved in a boatload of other uh, awful and criminal and felonious activity. They hate U.S. citizens. Can't say that more than you can't say that enough. They have nothing but contempt for U.S. citizens, and they hate even more anybody who served in the U.S. Armed Forces. So, according to this, 212A, 7AII of the Immigration and Nationality Act, as amended, as an immigrant who at the time of application for admission is not in possession of a valid unexpired immigrant visa, re-entry permit, border crossing card, or other valid entry document required by the Act, and a valid unexpired passport or other suitable travel document or document of identity and nationality as required under the regulations issued by the Attorney General under Section 211A of the Act. So here, more operating under the color of law, they are attempting to use a fraudulent act, which is specifically prohibited by the Constitution because the Constitution only states naturalization, that the Congress can do natural, a uniform rule of naturalization. It has nothing to do with entry. It has nothing to do with providing an excuse for kidnapping coerced attempts to kill, and the rampant violation of not only the rights, the constitutionally protected rights and immunities of foreigners, but also of U.S. citizens, flying directly in the face of their claim to serve and protect the public. Yeah. Which public are they protecting? That's the question. And that's the one that I hope to answer in the rest of this video. However, the other thing also, when it comes to this document that they did not follow through on, first of all, they signed this document stating that my fiance was read specifically a certain page in Spanish and it's signed and dated and everything. It was not read in Spanish. It was read in English. Highly technical, highly technical wording there. All legal jargon was read in English to a native Spanish speaker. Doesn't matter how much English she understands. Not to mention, they signed it. They signed it. Doesn't matter if she signed it, they signed it. They drew the document, they signed it, and they lied on it. That's perjury. And it's many other things, just like all of the other things they've done. I mean, the, the list is so long, and it cannot be construed as anything but acts of war. This is stuff that, that's warfare territory. They, they are belligerents. They're trying to cause a situation that damages domestic tranquility, one of the primary charges in the U.S. Constitution. Anyway, There's this notice of in-person hearing from the United States Department of Justice, Executive Office for Immigration Review, Cleveland Immigration Court. Now, if this is a crime that's being charged, it has to be a jury, right? Nope. It's an immigration judge that does it. I wonder if that guy swore an oath to the Constitution or a woman. And if they did, they are certainly not following it considering the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and quite a lot of this violates the Constitution and many parts of it directly. So one of the things is that they're always threatening deportation. That, inst that institutes the concept of coercion. They are always threatening it. And they're threatening it for failure to appear. So if you don't appear before them, then they're going to do this and that, right? That's coercion. But 
This document states So, in under failure to appear, it states that if you fail to appear at your hearing and the Department of Homeland Security establishes by clear, unequivocal, and convincing evidence that written notice of your hearing was provided and that you are removable, you will be ordered removed from the United States. That's very odd to include under the failure to appear section. And mind you, this entire document is written in English and not, there is no translation provided. But either way, that's very coercive and threatening. But it also does not follow anything in the Constitution that has to do with the trial of crimes. It is simply whether or not one side proves to a judge, not a jury, unequivocally that they provided notice. That kind of weird, very strange wording in that document. And we'll get into what the implications of that are in the next part of this video, which has drastic and damaging consequences for not just foreigners, but every U.S. citizen in this nation and every single member of the U.S. Armed Forces that swore an oath of allegiance to the Constitution if you swear an oath to the allegiance to the Constitution, that means you have no choice but to respond to these direct and willful actions by these individuals, not only at the border, but all their conspirators that infest the rest of this country.